The following program is a special presentation of Cleveland's own New Center 8. In the early morning hours of June 6, 1944, 50 years ago, the German forward observers looking out from the long battery here would have had a fantastic sight. 5,000 Allied ships carrying 160,000 men about to take part in the largest single military operation in the history of modern warfare. It's doubtful that those in here would have been thinking about history, more like their immediate futures. And if there's one thing in common that those in here and those out at sea had, it was that neither knew how the day was going to end. Of course, 50 years later, we do know how it ended, and that it was a day that changed everything. And it was called D-Day. If there is one element that is attributed to the success of D-Day, it would be surprise. In the avalanche of Allied accounts written after the war by historians, they have led us to believe that the Germans never knew what was coming, and when it happened, never knew what hit them. But only now is it being revealed that surprise wasn't the Allies' greatest weapon. It was perhaps their greatest myth. Yes, you felt optimistic. It had to turn out right with this many people and catching them off guard so much. That was the, that was the optimistic part. When the coded messages to the French resistance were sent out alerting them of the invasion, resistance fighters weren't the only ones tuned in. So were the Germans. The intelligence of the German army had broken the codes. Alerts were immediately transmitted to forces in Europe. The invasion was imminent. Fortunately for the Allies, the German generals on the beaches of Normandy scoffed at the warnings, calling them just another wild rumor. They were ignored. Nature itself helped to reassure those generals that the Allied invasion was not about to happen, lashing the Normandy area with a powerful storm. The planning for D-Day, or Operation Overlord, took years, and it went down right to the very smallest of details. Yet despite all that planning and preparation, there was one factor that the Allies, and neither the Germans for that matter, could control. The same thing that caught us off guard, the weather. And yet, it would be the most critical factor of all. An invasion couldn't take place without the right weather. As it looked June 5th, there was to be no D-Day. The invasion was postponed. Some feared it would have to be canceled altogether. But one American meteorologist came forward and said the weather would clear. Now, originally, we told Ike he could go on this day. It wouldn't be perfect. It wouldn't be just a clear weather deal, but we knew from the specifications we were given that it would be operational. He was right, the Germans were wrong, and D-Day changed the war. Well, um, this um, is fantasy. And, Heinz uh, Littau says conventional history has it all wrong. As a major attached to the German weather forecasting branch, he ought to know. To begin with, Littau says the German command knew exactly when the Allies were coming, because military minds tend to think alike. Every general staff officer can imagine himself in the situation that he has to be in charge of the invasion. And the highest and lowest tides and light at night time will be during the full moon. The idea seems to be that um, highest probability on around the 6th of June. They not only knew when, according to Latau, the Germans pretty much knew where because of that same military thinking. Then the other reason for being a favorable spot for, for having there's a very smooth um, uh, sand um, beach there uh, where the, 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 landing, uh, the landing boats could run up on high tide and, um, and being in the dry and letting out all the vehicles and so on and so on. Normandy was the perfect choice. That leaves weather as the only remaining question mark, and Latau says the Germans had that pegged too. Every German meteorologist was only supposed to say what the weather is. Conclusions about meteorological, uh, uh, tactical conclusions were absolutely taboo for the meteorologist. He, he wasn't supposed to do that. In the history books, much has been written about Major Latau, and by now, it should come as no surprise, Latau says history got that wrong too. 
Much of the misinformation, Latow says, can be traced back to England in 44, where he was taken for debriefing soon after he was captured in France. I quoted the record according to the history books to him. Group Captain Stagg had an interesting talk with Major Latow, the chief German meteorologist. Fantasy. I wasn't. The German weatherman was anxious to know how our forecast for the Allied invasion was made and why we decided on the night of June 5th and 6th. True or false? I think, <laughs> I think this, uh, this is all made up. Here's the real line that begins to sort of hang you out to dry. It says, he had advised his superiors that the invasion after June 4th was impractical because of stormy weather moving in from the Atlantic. This was absolutely fantasy. The German major said they were taken completely by surprise when the Allied right. invasion started on no. June 6th. No. Ironically, many men have been ignored by history. Heinz Latau says history has made too much of him. As for D-Day itself, history is only now accepting that the Germans weren't really that surprised. Fortunately for the Allies, the enemy may have known the Allies were coming. They simply chose not to believe it. You think you would always remember the place where someone tried to kill you. On the beaches, it is easy to remember. But inland in Normandy, where most of the bloody fighting took place, the memories are not so easy, not so precise. Though little has changed in the Normandy area in the last 50 years, the killing fields have turned green again. Nature has healed her man-made wounds of war. Those who go in search of the past here often leave frustrated, unable to find it. That frustration often brings them to the door of Henri Laveau. I began to collect uh, this thing in, uh, when I began to work in uh, around uh, 53. Henri and history both greet you at the door to his office in Perrier. Oh, this is strange. At least it's not common. This was a pistol for a spy. Really? Oh, I see, yeah. yeah. But there is a, this is a silencer, mm -hmm. and there was a, the cartridge we're, we're here. His outer office is home to a collection of war memorabilia. It's a bobby trap, and uh, it's wood so you cannot detect it, and uh, there was TNT inside. And the humorous. The German gas mask for a horse. For a horse? And these are all things you found? You haven't purchased any? No, no, oh no, never. Where do you find them? Well, in the fields, yeah. Do you? Oh, yeah. Uh, or, uh, or they are given to me. But for Henri, these are not the important things. What he considers far more precious are his maps and his memories. My main enemy is time. When it comes to the war, Henri has an unusual gift. He can find both the living and the dead. At the beginning, it's because I like to do it. And uh, then I very soon realized that also it was useful for the veterans. It was useful for me at the beginning because I like to learn. And more I learn and more I can share with other veterans when they come. And it helps them, I think. It's what they say, they are happy when they come back mm -hmm. and they can find their, their place. On his walls are the stuff dreams and nightmares are made of. So you see, you can see every hedge row. Mm -hmm. And the fox all... Henri knows where every battle, skirmish, and life and death drama, the battle for Normandy, was played out, often in hidden country lanes, farmers' fields, and hedgerows. His obsession with recording them started as a hobby, born out of a former job. For my job, I was um, an engineer for a, a small company with electric power lines, so I was almost half a day in the fields at least, uh, drawing the lines, survey and something like that. So I had very detailed maps. On the next Sunday, I went back with my children, sometimes my wife, on the spot to spend more time and ask the people uh, if they knew Aaron, if they knew something of the battle. Henri took his maps and his information and matched them with war dispatch reports. And suddenly, history could be rediscovered, and men could find their past. I know by the unit and by the date where he was. It, if he's looking for his father or 
was killed or the place where a friend was wounded. Henri could find them. His walls are a treasure beyond value. Some of them came several times before and never found the place. Henri will many times take a veteran to his own personal battlefield and the former soldier's own private past. Uh, quite often they cry. Yeah. Quite often they cry and then I let them alone for a few minutes. Today he takes us to one of his favorite places where he has been many times before. If a lost tourist would pass this place, he might remark on its beauty. Only Henri knows it belies a deadly past. When the American attack the 22nd of July on the other side of the river, and the German where, where we are, uh, you see the attack at 5.30 in the morning, and at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the first men were still in the bank of the river. They could not get out of the water. Strategically, it was a big mistake because it was the only battle, the only attack that day for all, all the front. So every German gun was ready to answer. How many men died here? 100 men died. 244 were taken prisoner and several hundred, say three or four hundred, were wounded. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was a defeat for the Americans. Oh, yes. So many men lay dead or dying during what later became known as the Battle for Sivs Island. The two American chaplains called for a truce. So two American chaplains came from the aid station across the fields. They waved a Red Cross flag and the fire stopped. In one of those great ironies of war, civility brought a halt to the killing. So more killing could follow. But after three hours, uh, they had to begin again. Is this like sacred soil to you? Oh, yes. Every, every time I come and... Uh, you cannot think... Uh, I cannot think anything else, you see. I pass a farmer's shed with hardly a glance. Henri beckons, we go in. The sunlight through the bullet holes starkly illuminates that this simple building was a witness to horror. To Henri, these are the real monuments to the Battle of Normandy. On this uh, next small sunken lane, we can still see the trench where the German were waiting for the American. Also something important um, is that uh, it's very important when the wife come back with the veteran. Why? Because uh, somebody else tells a story the husband told many times and nobody care. And coming from somebody else, they can, they, and being on the, on the spot, you see, uh, the ladies can understand that it was not uh, very, very funny, very sad, because when you know that, when you are in the detail, you see, it's something else. Mm -hmm. The death, death is not something very clean. You cannot see much, but the German dug here and he made a T in the middle of the hedge. More German hole, another one. Here was an American foxhole. Henri knows, perhaps better than anyone, the price that was paid to liberate his country. The county of Perrier is about 13 kilometers long from north to south. And there was uh, 141 killed and 4,000 and, 4, and several hundred men wounded. So uh, if you all of these casualties on the line, it will give you one wounded each 2.5 meter and one killed every 11 meters. If you ask me one more time why uh, we do what we do, okay, <laughs> why did they, did they do what they did? And uh, what we are doing is almost strictly nothing <laughs> compared to the I would say even the most coward of them did much more than I, I can do. He says one man summarizes that sacrifice for his homeland, Jim Flowers, an American tank commander who was critically wounded and still continued the fight. 
this guy lost two legs in two different days, you see, and, uh, and uh, Jim, you can ask him the question, he say, I will do it again for you. I cannot stay behind, you see, with this kind of fellow. Uh. Henri Laveau is a peacemaker. His maps, his memories, are allowing veterans after 50 years to finally make peace with themselves. The marking of the 50th anniversary of D-Day is officially the last major remembrance of the Normandy invasion. There are already rumblings within some French political circles that France has said thank you enough. Those are not necessarily the feelings of the French people, especially in Normandy, where as an American television crew, we were still approached by people expressing their gratitude 50 years later. And certainly D-Day will live on in the memories of those who were there. Well, in a way I feel honored. In a way I feel a coward that I could have got through with my buddies. Look at how many young men were in the service, 16, 17, 18 years old, that never had a life to live, the best years of their life, that was taken away, mm -hmm. just like that. We lost 66 and two thirds percent of our battalion in Normandy. Really? Mm -hmm. Either killed, missing in action, or captured. But what will happen to the memory of D-Day after the veterans and the memorial services are gone? France and Europe during World War II. Philippe Joutras yeah. is a retired American and the curator of the Airborne Museum in St. Mary Eglise. He does not believe that the local dedication to D-Day will continue to burn as brightly as it has. It did take 50 years or on the great anniversaries of the 40th anniversary and the 50th uh, to stimulate all this interest. But I think it will be ephemeral. I think after, this is the last official uh, ceremony in France, and uh, naturally, uh, we are uh, getting older, and uh, there'll be no more uh, official celebrations. Will the memory remain? Will the, the dedication to that memory remain? Uh, well, there are a lot of markers, there are a lot of plaques that are offered, that, that streets named after veterans, and so on and so forth. Here, but in France, no. So you must remember that. This is a special area. Howard Manorion, a paratrooper who helped to liberate the town of St. Marigliese and another relocated American, says the memory of D-Day will live on in the young. This town is still special. Every year they have a celebration here. That continues. That's every year. Joseph Rivers is the superintendent of the American Cemetery in Normandy. He believes even after the D-Day survivors are gone, Normandy will continue to attract people wanting to remember. D-Day uh, is not just a question of an invasion. It was probably a day where our country showed its first major sign of maturity and that this was the culmination of probably the first massive national effort in the United States, that being the liberation of Europe. D-Day is a tremendous symbol for our nation. The weather changes constantly. The land does not. One of the questions I most often ask since returning from Normandy is, has it changed? The answer is no. Like the veterans who were there, the land itself is still haunted by its past. What did you see as you came down? I remember just flames. I don't remember anything else. I wasn't looking for anything else. I was trying to see if I could see the terrain, where I'm going to land. You know, I wouldn't want to land in a church steeple or in a tree. I saw on the horizon, silhouetted against the horizon, what looked like a home. I headed for it. I said, we're here to drive the Germans all the way back to Berlin. The sea of dead men that I saw when I hit the beaches, I thought they were there, lying there, 
uh, ready to fire. Of course, they were shooting right down our throats. They were all dead. I seen all these thousands of men, like a, a black wave, running and running and running. I, I, I couldn't believe it. As the other waves were coming in, a shell would hit on one side, then one on the other, the next one direct hit, and there to go, men and all. At the time, most of us felt that maybe this was a war that would end all wars, which it didn't. The problem with history is that we tend to forget that at the time, the outcome of events were never certain. There was no guarantee that D-Day was going to work. And in fact, there were many times it was thought it would not. And if it had failed, it would have been years before the Allies could try again. Years in which Germany would continue to develop its secret weapons, its jet engine aircraft, its rockets, maybe even an atomic bomb to go on those rockets. And some speculate they could have reached the east coast of the United States. Had that happened, the world would be a far different place. And we would all be far different people. How different? For uns ist eine Tragödie für die Welt, aber ist es eine Katastrophe. Perhaps the difference between whether you understood what I said or not. The fact that most of you didn't is the debt we will always owe to those who came here on June 6, 1944. I'm Martin Savage. Thank you for watching.